Welcome to Being Paleo. Our focus on these podcasts is to nourish not only your body, but your whole being, body, mind, and soul. Through the understanding of paleo cooking, philosophy, art, and the mystics of overall wellness. Especially in a world full of emotional and environmental stress, exploring the health benefits of how food choices impact the biological and psychological being is critical towards finding a positive life balance. Our desire is to educate and inspire others by our journey into being paleo, by altering misperceptions of the foods we eat, but also how learning more about our ancient ancestors, coupled with the work of historical and modern philosophers and artists, can be used as a mantra for needed lifestyle changes. Especially after COVID-19, our new normal needs to be explored, but with mindful changes. Considerations of the Paleolithic era can teach us methods of how to pull away from the trap of our fast-paced modernity and place breath back into our natural human state of an ideal processing of food, which can then help our total being in the contemporary day. Uh, We are talking about what is being paleo. um, And I would like to introduce Elena for talking about and getting us started on this discussion because um, she's got some very interesting things that have occurred in her life that set her on the paleo path. Um, and then we'll just kind of go into a dialogue about it. So Elena, why don't you share with us your, what put, put you on the paleo path? <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, so the paleo lifestyle really occurred from some physical um, problems I was having with my health. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I went through some severe gluten uh, allergies and as anyone knows that has an allergy, if you have, if you say you have to be gluten free or dairy free, people sometimes look at you like you're just following some sort of uh, fad or you're being extra. Uh, and for those of you who think that, I assure you, these people are not being extra. Like nine out of ten, these people are not being extra, and it's it's difficult because. You know, you could go out with your friends and say, you know, I'm not eating gluten. And they'll be like, I'll just just splurge just one time. And uh, I was doing that a lot. And I was getting more and more unhealthy and uh, more and more sick. And I was having problems with bloating, weight gain, mind fog. Um, And, you know, I would go out and have once a week, I'd say, oh, I can splurge once a week and go have a bottle of wine and cheese and bread. and, And then one of my girlfriends, um, when I was in Italy, we were staying at this beautiful, um, it was a vineyard and it had a lot of houses and I was, I was in the, the allergen house and these girls, I was, I was put with them very much so on purpose, um, apart from the rest of our cohort. Uh, and they helped me because, you know, I was still in that mind frame of, oh, it's okay. You know, my body can, can get, rid of it within a couple days and they said every time your body heals and then you do that to yourself again your body has to go through that same momentum and heal again and go back and forth back and forth back and forth and it's almost as if i was listening to this podcast the other day about uh breakups and when you you see that person again or you start dating again you think it's good Uh, you go through that breakup again and again and again. And so it's almost like, you know, you're going through this breakup with food and then you're having that moment of, you know, perhaps a lapse of judgment and you indulge and then your body goes through the whole breakup issue. And that your body going through that is an emotional process too. Um, And so that that summer with those girls was really good um, for me. And it was also at this point where I had been going through a lot of issues um, and I was having what I thought was um, food poisoning and it was not, it was my gallbladder going bad (laughs) and I would have these, it was horrible. I'd wake up at two, three, four in the morning with these horrible attacks um, and what I thought was my stomach and I thought it was just somehow poisoning myself with what I was eating or I was having some sort of you know, new allergy. And it wasn't, it was a gallbladder attack. And um, anyone who's had gallbladder attacks knows that it's nothing fun to deal with. It's it's horrific. People have actually categorized it as the same pain as childbirth. Um, and so you're going through this over and over and over again. 
and uh, I had some really bad ones and I didn't know what to do. I was going to, I had a really bad one the one night. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I threw my back out because the pain radiates your back too. And I had a, I was going to Europe the next day or within 48 hours. And so I had gone to the emergency room. They did a CT scan. They saw that my gallbladder was having issues. And um, I was like, well, I'm going <laughs> across seas to Europe for a couple of weeks after, you know, within a couple of days. And I, I asked my doctor, I'm like, is this something I can do? And, and um, my family doctor said, well, you just have to really stay away from fats. Uh, and because if you start to have the pain, you really need to go to the emergency room and you, you'll probably have to have it taken out while you're in Europe. Uh, and as we all know, insurance is uh, a bugger <laughs> and I did not want that to happen. So that helped me really clean my act up when I was in Europe those couple of weeks, but I still had attacks every so often. Um, and, you know, every little thing for me, I can add a lot to my life. Sometimes I had too much, but when we when really break it down to these, these core components and go a little bit more minimalist, um, we have more clarity. And so I wasn't going minimalist. I was still, you know, it, eating different things and processed foods, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, and which was leading my body to uh, have these gallbladder attacks. So I came, long story short, I came home back to the States. Uh, I had my gallbladder out uh, within a few days after that because uh, I had come back and within the lapse of a few days being back in the States, I had two to three more attacks. Um, and my surgeon was really good, got me in, um, uh, my gallbladder was taken out and I was a lot better after that. But from that, I had to really clean up my diet. Um, and so really, really, um, sparse, uh, oils as it was before when I was having the attacks. Um, cause what happens with the gallbladder is it can't emulsify the oil. And so it, it leads to stones and it leads to the gallbladder pulsating and going into this attack, which is excruciatingly painful. Um, and then when you don't have the gallbladder anymore, um, your bile, uh, that, the gallbladder uses to emulsify the fats for digestion. Um, it just, it goes the whole time because usually the gallbladder is that area for the bile to collect uh, before it, it shoots out the emulsified um, product to digest the oils. And so it takes the body a little bit to acclimate to not having that reservoir for the bile and the bile coming out um, at all times, um, the bile that helps the, the oils break down. So I really said, you know, what, what do I need to do here to make myself feel better? Because I was feeling better. I wasn't having the attacks, but I was still, I was still wasn't there. You know, I still was having a lot of issues with my stomach, um, bloating and then pain um, and just, just overall pain. And it, I, I knew my body wasn't digesting well. Um, and so I was like, geez, oh man, what else can I do? Because I, I had broken down. I wasn't eating um, any bread, any gluten. Uh, I was lowering my fat count. I think at that time I, I wasn't eating cheese or lowering my cheese count. Um, and then I said, well, I need to just go completely dairy-free, gluten-free, um, and limit the processed foods. Um, and again, at that time too, I was still drinking alcohol. I don't drink alcohol anymore because I don't like the effects on my body. Um, and so again, going back to the minimal, minimal, minimal. Um, and my ex-boyfriend, he had this paleo cooking book uh, while we were together. And I always would look at it and I, I didn't really think too much of it. I always thought, oh, that's like the meat eaters cookbook and um, whatnot. And I was, but it came to me when I was going through all this and I thought, you know what, let me, let me go back into this and do some research on that. For some reason, that cookbook always stood out in my mind. Um, it was kind of like that little glimmer that you see in your peripheral and you're like, oh, there's something shiny over there, but it's over there, you know? And I started researching it and I started eating that way and I felt remarkably better um, the further and further I went into it and I lost a lot of weight. Um, and, you know, you have to, you have to keep it up um, and you have to be really diligent. And there's times where you're going to want to, you know, kind of indulge a little bit. And now if I indulge, it's, 
I'm indulging in a vegan cheese, you know, um, but you have to be really careful with processed foods. Um, so according to the USDA, a processed food is defined as any raw commodity that has been subject to washing, cleaning, milling, cutting, chopping, heating, pasteurizing, blanching, cooking, canning, freezing, drying, dehydrating, mixing, packaging, and other procedures. So if it wasn't cut from the earth <laughs> and you know you're you're seeing it in a package so even some of like you know our carrots to cut carrots that that's that's a processed food because it's gone through the chopping and cleaning but it's a lot less than you would have for a bag of cheetos right but wouldn't you say that i mean so when i read that um what made me think is if i think back to paleolithic man um by the definition of the USDA, they would be doing some processed foods as well. So we know that Native American would take buffalo and would dehydrate it. Right. And that kept them through the winter months. But mm -hmm. um, it's the way we process food. So, um, and I guess I learned this a little bit myself because we actually went out and bought a half a cow, my family. Oh, nice. Yeah. From somebody who we knew how they raised it. It was great. It, it was it was uh, let, uh, to roam the pasture and and, and feed free range. Um, yeah, free range, grass fed, um, very organically. Um, you know, allowed to to move around. Um, no human growth hormone. No no antibiotics because they're not stacked up next to each other getting sick. Right. Um, and then we took it to a butcher who we knew um, what their procedure was for butchering. Um, and I, that became an awareness for me because I watched um, the um, hidden cameras that I think PETA did um, at some of the food processing plants um, that was in a way horrific to me as well, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. showing animals. So a way, according to, there are not very many FDA regulators that are out there. If you think about the number of people versus the number of, of facilities that they have to monitor. Um, but according to the FDA, when you, when an animal that cannot cross into the um, area for the slaughtering, if they can't do that on their own volition, they're not supposed to be slaughtered. And yet you'll see farmers who spent a lot of money on the, you know, raising these animals that have to go to, to market at a certain time for them to get paid. They had it on a forklift truck and they were trying to get this sick animal across the, you know, to, to walk in of its own volition and it just couldn't. Um, mm -hmm. And that, so that's the one thing is animals that are unhealthy that are being pushed into these processing plants. And then right. when you get into the processing plant, um, according to the FDA rules, if you even nick the stomach, and I don't even mean like open it up, but just nick it, you mm -hmm. are supposed to throw the animal completely out, stop all production and clean all machines because yeah. that's when it, you know E. coli and listeria can get into the food supply. And yet we right. all know that I mean, I hate to say it because I can, I can, I, I play both sides in my head as an independent voter and thinker is I can understand somebody who spent a lot of money and that's how they make their money is trying to get this to, you know, to market, but also, you know, we'll push maybe something that's a little bit unhealthy um, to do that. On the other hand, I understand from the food supply, like how you wouldn't want that to happen. So we made that choice to have that animal process the way we want to so that we could eat healthier meat. And I think that sometimes people go radical and think, okay, well, it shouldn't be any processed meat, but I think it's just using care because Native Americans, and they would technically be Paleolithic because um, Paleolithic time period is from about 2 million BC to about 10 million or 10,000 BC mm -hmm. would be Paleolithic man. And then you get into Neolithic man um, and peoples, which would be, you know, anything from 10,000 beyond. So really truly stone age. And what they're finding from archeological sites, cause there's not that many of them. I mean, again, we're talking 2 million years old, um, that they're finding they, they were processing it, but they were processing it in a more healthy and organic way. If that makes right. sense. Um, so they were chopping, you know, you, you can see the cut marks now on, um, on, on bison bones, um, showing that they were scraping the meat off of off of it and um, and eating into the marrow of 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 you know whatever meat source that they were, were they were pulling into or um, but they wouldn't have been pasteurizing for example and they would not I mean blanching maybe I don't know 
um, definitely cooking. Um, I don't know that they would be canning per se, um, drawing, yes. But so I see some of that balance myself personally, whereas I know that the FDA is um, more strict about saying, you know, if you cut carrots, then technically that is a process. Um, but yeah, I can see why, you know, somebody has to come up with that definition. So um, I would see some of that variance in it a bit. But again, if you're talking about, that's why we see lettuce that now gets E. coli, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's processed, but it's processed in a way that's not careful versus if I took lettuce and washed it in my own sink. Right. Um, so yeah, so to your saying, to your point, that that can cause allergies and that can cause toxins to get into the food supply. Right, and the different types of, um, if there's using anything to clean with, um, as we know, there's so many laundry detergents that are, the, the, you know, quote unquote, clean and clear and um, no perfumes, no additives, uh, because people are having reactions. Um, and so even if you're buying something that's organic, that cleaning process, if they've added anything to it, and it might even be what they're using to clean their machines and not what they're using to actually clean the lettuce, for instance. Um, you know, there's so many things that our bodies are very sensitive. Our bodies are very strong though. You know, I don't want to go into this um, doom and gloom that we're, we're sensitive little, little beings. Our bodies are extremely strong, um, but at the same token, we have to take care of them. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you wouldn't want to take a car uh, on a saltwater beach all the time and then think it can go drive on the highway, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, we were just talking about what is an allergy, and, and, and I always was telling Elena that, you know, with, with my students, I'm always telling them that, you know, because we, we get into a lot of different discussions when it comes to marketing, because it's all about the marketing is the process of taking an idea and, and going through all the, the business processes and whatnot. And I said, you know, an allergy is your, is your body's way of saying, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been telling you for a while, I don't like it, and now I mean it. I'm going to make you have right. hives, I'm going to make it uncomfortable for you, so that you get whatever it is that I don't want or I, I can't have away from you. Um, but to your point, many people don't want to listen until it becomes catastrophic for their bodies. And then they're into right. like, you know, where it's a disease and illness. Um, so you're right, listening to your body. And I think that's why I got into paleo a little bit was um, I've gained a lot of weight um, in the past several years. And it stemmed from a car accident that I was in that I just never lost weight from. But I've noticed that um, in addition to adding on a little additional eating, you know, emotional eating now, I really feel bloated and I, I struggle, um, you know, during certain cycles um, of my body that I, I, I struggle with the, the weight gain um, from the water bloating and just not eating yeah. the right choices and realizing that maybe my body is sensitive to gluten because I do, I do love my breads. Um, um, Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why you know, this paleo has been great because you can make breads that you can eat, um, but it's a healthier bread. And to your, to your point, when, I think when I started this up full force, when we first started talking, I, I said, I felt like I hadn't lost any weight, but you, what did you ask me? You're like, but do you feel less bloated? And I said, exactly. absolutely. Um, yeah. So yes, I mean, there's many different ways to get into it. But again, if I'm noticing something that, that's going on with my body, it's not necessarily going to scream, hey, get, you know, become more gluten-free. Um, but if you're listening to the body's changes or you're struggling with the same thing over and over, it's, mm -hmm. that's a message your body is sending you. You're just not listening. 100%. 100%. So I completely agree. So it's been interesting to listen to you, how you've had to take that deep dive um, from, you know, a physical ailment, but also how you chose to manage it by going to Europe and just saying, okay, well, I still want to go, but how do I manage this until at least I can come back? So right. that's, you know, and that must've been extremely hard because, you know, it's so tempting tough. going to Europe, you have the breads and um, the bakeries and all that kind of stuff. So that yeah. took a lot of self-control on your part. So kudos to you for doing Thanks. that. I mean, I still had attacks though. I remember one night I was in Paris and I had, it was a night right before I left and we had gone out with a friend and um, he was like, it's our last night in Paris. Let's, you know, just eat whatever we want. But, you know, I was like, I have to be healthy. But within that we had some fish and then we had this, this 
this nut thing and then some lattes and whatnot. Anyways, the fat count was way too much. I think overall, I was still eating extremely healthy, but the fat count was too much and I had the worst attack. Um, and then I only had maybe two hours of sleep and I had a board of flight oh, to come back. Oh my God, it was horrific. Um, and I just remember going through the attack and being like, please body, don't. Because if your gallbladder explodes, it, it will empty out into your stomach cavity and it can kill you. Um, and so I was like, I really don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to have the surgery. I want to get back to the States. And I, it was some of the worst pain. And it also, it was the emotional of it. And you know about the emotional eating, um, neurologically, like physically as well, when we eat, when we're feeling emotional, it's because the blood then goes down to the stomach and whatever we're feeling in our minds, because what we think in our minds actually propels the feeling through our body. And that, you know, what's what creates anxiety and um, depression and everything. It's, it's our thoughts that create everything. But so when we eat something, um, since the food is in the stomach, the body focuses its energy on digesting that then. And then so for those little moments of time, you don't feel as bad, you know, because your body is working on that. And so it, it's taking all its, its energy in the blood and um, to digest and work on that. And then, then you, you know, if you're making bad decisions, then your body's really working on it through your intestines and then you feel mm -hmm. bad. But you kind of take away from that little moment of neurosis. Um, but that's why I think that, and then that's, that's not why I think about that. That's they've clinically proven why food is addictive. Um, and it releases that beautiful little neurotransmitter dopamine mm -hmm. that is that addictive neurotransmitter. So same thing when cocaine addicts take a hit of cocaine, it's a, a rush of dopamine. Same thing happens when we eat things, especially sugar. Um, and so it is a full body experience and we have to be extremely conscious of that. I think a lot of our decisions are unconscious decisions. It, it comes from this, this realm of want and we have to be really careful about what we want in one moment and how it progresses into mm -hmm. the results of the next and the following, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's never that simple. You know, we think that things are simple. Life is never that simple. No, and it's not, it's just, you know, it goes, I think, back to that where we talked about conscious awareness. I mean, like I was watching, and you'll hear me a lot on podcasts, because I am, even one of my employees, Todd, laughs at me all the time, because I'm always watching documentaries, because that's how mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. that's how, with keeping up with my crazy, insane schedule, um, watching documentaries is how I learn. And I can also listen to them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, so that something I'm learning that's new can embed in my mind. But Right. I was watching something about um, Neanderthals because I'm very fascinated by Neanderthals. They would be considered Paleolithic peoples. Mm -hmm. um, but they were doing a study where they took somebody who would have been in the shape of a modern human, which is athletic um, and, and streamlined, and had them sit in a bath of ice water along with somebody who would have had the um, body type of a Neanderthal, which was an open um, lower um, rib cage. So mm. there, ours narrows down and tapers into a waist and theirs actually um, either maintained the same and or flared out a bit. Um, mm. But they were actually, these two guys were sitting in this ice bath and they actually had to stop the study because the guy who would have been replicating modern human was like literally heading into hypothermia. Oh, yeah. and the other person was still sitting there. And mm. when they looked at the heat imaging afterwards, um, you could see that all the heat and all the energy of the body went away from the extremities and went right to the stomach um, in order to mm. help continue to process, which is why after you have a meal, your hands will go cold mm -hmm. um, or you'll feel chilled because your body sends all of its energy to the food, you know, to your stomach to help you process that food. Um, but what is also interesting to me is that like in Italy, when we're there with our cohort group, um, Italians eat different food choices at different times than Americans mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. food order and what they eat. So we eat a salad first and they eat salad. their salad last um, mm -hmm. or they'll drink their wines at a certain time. And even like, if you look at um, Parisians, I mean, they eat very heavy cream base and yet they're very right. thin and, and some levels healthier than we would by definition. I mean, they smoke, you know, obviously different, but you know, even um, I remember when I went to Europe um, for school the first time um, to me in England, 
the, they were classic, you know, smokers, thin, um, you know, very active, whatever. Um, and the second time I went back, um, and this was probably about 2006, I remember getting into the car and hearing an, um, a radio show about should women that are obese be allowed to have fertility treatments? And I thought, God, like, this is odd to hear them talking about obesity. Uh -huh. And then I'm watching some programs on television and I hear them talking, they, they had done a family swap where they took a very healthy family and swapped the, the food choices that they were eating with a very unhealthy family. And then watching the, health, the unhealthy family that ate crappy that now ate well, they were healthy boundary, good sleep, you know, whatever. And then the family that ate healthy that were now eating unhealthily were sluggish, sleeping all the time, depressed. And I realized that I'm watching people in England, they're overweight. And I realized like they now have our food supply chain in their foods and their drug stores look different and their, and their grocery stores look different. And then when I went there the first time and I watched like, wow, like this transplant of our economy on their economy. And when it comes to the food supply was starting to negatively impact the, the Britons who normally would be able to withstand, you know, the, even the, the rigors of smoking. Um, because the, again, I don't think that smoking is great. I don't smoke myself um, because there's chemicals that are put on the tobacco leaves uh -huh. now to keep them so that they'll make it to harvest while you're smoking toxic chemicals. Because you can go down to the, the you know, South Americans who smoke um, as well and don't have some of the health effects that we right. have as well. So, you know, it's permeated in everything that you do, but to modern humans to say, okay, well, I'm now going to go back and eat paleolithic um it's it's a hard choice on some levels and that's you know from me making that shift um i was just sharing the story about mayonnaise um and i said i went to go make chicken salad yesterday with this mayonnaise i make which is olive oil egg and and lime and it's so simple to make and it's so fast to make and i went to the, the refrigerator and it was already moldy from the last time i made it and i'm like oh crap and it's not that i was upset that it that it had that I was going to have to make it again is that I was wasting food that I should have been eating um, because paleolithic peoples would eat and consume everything. So they weren't wasting anything. Mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of takes us to this transition to discuss like how, as we in modernity, how are we, how are we coping? Because we're not, we, 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 we yeah. as changed humans don't like change to begin with some cope better than others but how do you make those lifestyle changes? Like going back to paleo means that every Saturday or every Sunday, I'm going to have to prepare the foods for my, my next week. Um, I'm going to have to do my shopping at a certain time. I have to set aside valuable real estate time to cook so that I can eat like modern people eat, but I'm eating in a healthier way that is more like paleolithic man. Yeah, it's a, it's a hybrid and it takes time. And I think that's, we've, we've created this society where we want, you know, the, everything at our, at the, the fastest click of our fingers and it takes time. And even though like your recipe is very um, minimal, you know, it still takes time to make. And so that, that makes people say, well, it's just easier to buy it. Well, you know, is it though? Because your time is going to be sacrificed in one sense or another. So if you're buying it, you know, there's different grades of mayonnaise, of course, and then you're still sacrificing the time that you, you took to make the money in order to buy it. Um, and so there's still time involved. Um, and when we do go back to looking, like taking that time, um, to be mindful about ourselves and about the changes that we have to make, we're becoming one with our being, you know, and it, it does take time and it takes effort. Um, you know, I know that people have very, very busy lifestyles and schedules, but like you said, on that Sunday, break it down for the week, you take a little extra time and it, it's going to give you back time um, later on in the future mm -hmm. with your health. Um, and again, it, we're, we're constantly balancing our time and we're constantly doing checks and balances, right? And so you have to really think about, okay, maybe it's, it's easier to go to the drive-through, but 
how is that going to affect you later on? How is it going to affect you in an hour when that food is trying to digest in your system and you're having a heck of a time? Mm-hmm. How is it going to affect you 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Um, and so you're, you're sacrificing time in different ways. And so it's just, my biggest thing is please people be smart about how you sacrifice your time. Um, and small changes will start to add up small positive changes or negative. Right. Um, but I think that that goes into like this kind of like segues really like nicely into the, the philosophy part of, mm-hmm. of what we're thinking about with being paleo, because, um, you know, if, if philosophy is about being in the world, um, and there's many different philosophers that discuss from Hegel to, to Heidegger about being in the world, um, and how you take being in the world and you process that as your self-consciousness and how do I become mindful of things? I mean, first of all, there's that process of being aware that you have a problem um, because awareness is that first step to saying, okay, well, I keep doing this over, over and over again. How do I change my behavior so that I can do that? But being quiet, you know, Heidegger, and I really resonate with, with Heidegger in this sense of like before this com- podcast, I was out painting um, my railing that I put out there. And I was telling my carpenter who's building my shed, I actually like to paint. I like to build things um, because it helps me with problem solving. I also write my papers in my head um, for, the, you know, for our classes, because in my head, I'm working through problems. Even subconsciously, I might, I might walk away from, from a paper that I'm writing and then think about it even unconsciously where I'm out doing something and I'm not thinking about it. But that quiet time that you have, we don't, get that anymore. Like if you think about Paleolithic people, they didn't have the radio playing and they didn't have commitments to go places. They had commitments to survive and exist Mm -hmm. and take care of their clan and to reproduce. And, and I, I believe from, and I can never say the name of the, the French cave system where they found the early, um, artwork starts with Uh, Lacombe. You know, so they were artistic. I, I remember um, was watching a program on it, and the, I guess Picasso went to go see that you know, cave mm-hmm, structure mm-hmm. and came back out and and could see that they were like and the shapes of the horses. They were making the legs on the other side of the horse smaller. And he walked out and he said, "We created nothing new." <laughs> he yeah, said, you know, because yeah. because they were doing perspective as well. Um, so again, we think because we're modern that we're so much more sophisticated and technology makes us better. And yet as we go back and look at pre-Socratic history, which I define as the Paleolithic and Neolithic periods, even the Bronze and the Iron Age, is that they were they had sophisticated, you know, lives. They were weaving plant-based uh, fabrics, like the, the consistency of genes, the artwork that they were doing with gold and metalwork was just truly amazing but you don't see the remnants of it because it was all organic they lived right. within the construct of of their societies and they only created you know but i i would imagine they had necklaces they're finding um neanderthals for example had shell beads that either they would find natural holes in them or they would drill holes using a technique that we would never do um but they were making shell necklaces and they were adorning themselves in, in, a, in an aesthetic that we just don't understand and can't possibly understand but they are no different than us and um, I, I, you'll hear me get really angry on some levels and maybe it's another book I should write, but the, uh, the you know, cause I have a list of books that people tell me I should write and that I want to write, but I just, my, my instinct always tells me that, you know, you hear, oh, well, ne- you know, ne- um, Neanderthals went extinct. Well, how can they go extinct if I personally, as a European, um, have 4% Neanderthal in me, they merged they didn't go extinct. They're still in us. And that's why, you know, Europeans have different diseases than the Jewish have different diseases than even the Africans have different diseases. So um, we are truly all one peoples, um, but we just have different tolerance levels. Um, But yeah, I I think that from an artistic standpoint, you know, um, what's interesting to me right now, and this is what we've talked about is looking at it from a philosophical standpoint of how did paleo peoples live how do we get back to that to some level, but still coexist within our, our modern society? Because that's what makes us as beings. How do we get from like Heidegger's small being to upper being, the, the, the big B, which is a more enlightened Dasein? Um, because it's hard to do when you're just so in the world and you're just so consumed by it. So 
Absolutely. So fun fact about the caves at Lascaux, they've actually made a replica of the cave because they're not letting uh, tourists come into the original cave anymore mm -hmm. to preserve the paint. So they've made this beautiful replica. If anybody wants to just YouTube it, um, you'll see that they did an excellent job with creating um, a very lifelike replica. And it's, it's nearby the cave as well. I'd like to see it someday, but you're no longer able to go in because of our you know, our, our breath and people mm -hmm. touching things and um, disturbing that for our future generations. Um, and a little bit for our audience, we're going to be talking a lot about High Digger um, throughout these podcasts. And a little bit of background on him. Um, he was a German philosopher, born in 1889 and died in 1976. And he was a big component to question what Western philosophy um had come to and what they were saying. So, you know, Cartesian philosophy from, you know, Descartes, I think therefore I am, um, they never really question the M, like who, 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 you know, what, what is our being? Where does our being first originate from? So Descartes was more or less saying that the thought uh, is what makes us human, but what is, what is our being? What, what is that? Um, and so uh, Heidegger, was a student of Herschel who um, started the philosophy of phenomenology, which looks at the being in the world. Um, and so I think that some of that background really influenced his own philosophy, but he, he was talking about, as Amy was noting, you know, what is that pre-Socratic um, world? You know, before Plato and Socrates, uh, Aristotle, that we all know with Western philosophy, what if we never had them? What if we never had them transition into our modern day, well, any, any of our modern day and our metaphysics? What if they weren't there asking the questions they were asking? How would that Paleolithic stage propagate? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what Heidegger was really asking. Like, let's go back and um, think about, you know, thought before the thought of the thought, you know, who, who, who creates that thought? Um, and so we're, we're going to use Heidegger quite a bit, um, and just, just a really marvelous philosopher overall. Mm -hmm. Um, and Amy, if you want to go into, um, before we wrap up for the day, um, a little bit about, you know, maybe what you're doing within your research for it, because Amy is a, a huge champion of Heidegger's work on this note of questioning, um, which is all Western philosophy is asking the question, um, but I, I think Heidegger's work was pivotal in asking the question of what makes a being a being? You know, what, what, where, where did the being start? Like, how, right. how did that even originate? Right. So. I, I think that, uh, and I guess for the listeners too, is, um, you know, obviously we're on our own journey um, through our, our PhD program um, to understand more about philosophy and art and to really truly become um, artist philosophers. And I'd say that we're obviously in our fourth year, so we're halfway there. <laughs> um, we still have I our know dissertations. Me yeah. <laughs> I know me. But what we are planning on doing in these podcasts are to bring in um, our instructors um, and also philosophers and artists um, throughout the community um, into these podcasts so that they can anchor ideas that we're learning or expand on ideas that we want to talk about um, that we really feel are helpful um, to the overall discussion of what is you know, becoming an artist philosopher because it is, it is somebody who is questioning things but questioning um, where we're going and, and what path we're going on. And so that's where Heidegger was very pivotal. And he's obviously very controversial because of his ties to the Nazi party. But I think right. um, there are many philosophers and even businesses today that if you actually knew how tied they were to the Nazi party. Um, so it's a very interesting time period because even the swastika um, is, has origins in Hinduism and in, in India and parts of Serbia that was uh, the meant, it means peace and sun. And so um, we have these layers and layers and the topological studies that we go through as you start to see the layers of whether it's Berlin, like we just got off of a, a class um, 
talking about you know the layers in, in Berlin as a city. Um, so you know we'll bring in a lot of different people in these discussions. But Heidegger is is pivotal because again I think that um, at, you know if you were to take a look at Heidegger, um, he got into into the the regime because of its more egalitarian um, politics, meaning it was for the people. It was more going back to a Paleolithic type political structure. And I'm doing that right now in my second IS when I'm looking at shoes, um, because we often forget that shoes are also um, a linguistics for, you know, how we live our lives and culture and class. Um, but I think that that's why he was so interested in, in that party, but then it kind of got away from him. So a lot of his, his discourse about technology, for example, is is actually a discussion about anti-technology. He saw what mm -hmm. they were doing and didn't like it and, and saw the dangers of technology. And that's why he talks about like the artisan and the craftsman actually using a hammer, um, that knowingness of doing the, art, the artwork or doing the labor informs your being. Um, you now know what wood is soft, what wood is hard, and how you eliminate subject versus object because now the hammer is part of your hand. You feel it resonate when it hits something that informs your body, that creates a frequency within your body. It makes you, it's a hard work of day's labor. So you're exhausted. You don't have an idle mind because you're, 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 you're exhausted or you're thinking about things while you're doing. So, you know, we have forgotten that. I always tell my students in my classes, you know, when, you know, when our, our, forefathers got here to America, they didn't hop off the boat and said, where's the Motel 6? <laughs> you know, they were on <laughs> the only, boat. They could only wish. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they lived on the ships um, because they had no place to stay. And that's where log cabins came from. And then they realized that, yes, we have a log cabin on a dirt floor, but we've got to put tar between the, you know, because it gets cold at night. So we use sap from these trees to create, you know, the, the insulation between these. So it's layers of layers of learning of solving problems. Problems. And, and that's what engineering and my mother is the first female engineer. So you'll hear me talk about like what I've learned about with her and engineers. Engineers are not brilliant on some levels. They just solve problems, immediate problems. They're not thinking about what's going to happen 10 years down the road. They're just building something for today and solving the problems. Um, so we have layers of that. So he was naturally, I think, tapping into that there's something wrong, but there's something ideal, idealistic about what the origins of the Nazi party was that always intrigued him because again, he was searching to go back to the pre-Socratic um, period, which I, you know, we talk about what, what is pre-Socratic. And I think that's what I take away from being paleo from a philosophical and artist and an artistry perspective is I don't, I'm not calling it pre-Socratic. I'm calling it paleolithic and neolithic going back to those societies to say, so what is your political structure back then? What were you doing to construct your homes and what were you learning from them? What problems were you solving? What, what were you eating um, on some levels? Because they didn't live long lives, but that could have been because they were part of the elements. It could have been warfare at the time, all those things. So how do you bring forward what is healthy um, whether it's the food diet that we're looking at or the philosophy or the art that they're solving problems back then. Um, and art meaning, this goes back to the discussion of, I'm very passionate about the, art, the artisan, the craftsman over, let's say a fine artist. And I know that you're a fine artist, but I look at your work mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that's amazing. It's something I can't do with just paint or a, what you do with graphite and build that depth and the layers. I'm just, I'm, I'm truly stunned and amazed by that. Um, but you'll see some art out there where, you know, again, you go to the museums that we visit and I see like dumped dirt in the middle of the floor. And it's supposed to idealistic mean something. And I'm like, I, okay, <laughs> I don't get it, but I see what you're, trying to do. Um, but I think that the, the craftsman, like I, my grandmother tatted lace. It's the one thing that, that she taught me that I couldn't do because she just tatted so fast. But that's a lost art. You know, we were in, in Venice for our PhD, um, one of the residencies and going to the Biennale. And yet I didn't make it to, everybody wanted to go to the Murano glass island to see them make the you know, glass, which is a very ancient technique as well. I actually wanted to go to the island of Bar Barano where they make this lace that is actually, a dot. they don't have any young girls that are le learning it now. So when these older women will pass on, that lace technique will die. Right. 
and so I'm interested in not just fine art because fine art is beautiful and it has its, you know, it's, it's a narrative that's happening. Um, sometimes those things we don't understand are a critique on modern society, but I'm always interested in looking at the artisan um, because we live our life in that type of art, but I think we take it for granted sometimes and going back to um, Paleolithic peoples were doing art as well and that's the caves and the drawings and the necklaces and things that they were doing um, that are very interesting to me right now. So yes, I'm a huge Heidegger fan, but I'm also a huge Hegel fan after spending some time doing my last paper on Chanel um, and looking at it from, let's say, the master-slave dialectic that's used, but I don't know that it's read the way I read it. So hopefully, you know, future podcasts will bring out some of these elements. So some of these philosophers like Heidegger or Hegel, or you, you read Marlo Ponte a lot, um, they're, love, love. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're deep. They're just, there's so much to what they were thinking about and problems they were trying to solve. So extracting the whole of what they were trying to do, but then all the little pieces that you could take away from it um, are interesting to this discussion of Paleolithic peoples. So I'm excited to, to delve into that as well, but we'll bring people in to discuss it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just want to note too for our listeners, um, Amy brings up the Nazis because, you know, Heidegger always has that connection to him. Um, in no way we're propagating anything Nazi. <laughs> Nazis oh, gosh, did horrible, no. horrible things. Um, just that, bringing that up to, to add that context, that, that we, we're aware of that background. Um, but, you know, to look at the other um, attributes he's made uh, towards philosophy. Um, well, yeah, and to, to that point, I mean, you bring up a good point, is that I'm, just so you know, for the listeners, for me, I don't ignore things. So I acknowledge them as being what they are in, in a space and time and learn from them because I'm a, a big believer that if we don't understand our learn from our history, that we are doomed to repeat it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you believe it. It just means you acknowledge it, recognize and learn from it. So, um, and that can be for any of the belief systems of any of the philosophers that we read. We've got some that are, you know, alcoholics. There are some that are, have, they're, they're flawed beings. There's some that have gone crazy. Um, um, Nietzsche is one who spent time in um, an insane asylum. Um, but what he would say is don't judge me based on the way I live my life, but judge me based on what I see and observe and how will you fix these problems. So I'm not one to shy away from a controversial topic, um, but to learn from it instead of to to glorify it. So, um, a great point to bring that up um, because again, you know, you've got uh, uh, you know Lacan, who's one who um, was looking at things. Or Levinas, uh, he was actually a prisoner, um, a Nazi. He um, was a Jewish. Um, in a concentration camp. Um, and his whole discussion as a philosopher was how do I learn to love the other when that other hates my guts and doesn't see me as a being or as a person. Super so hard. these philosophers are, are delving into some deep topics, but a lot of them are because they're in the world, they're in this, this thing called life that is hard, it's difficult, it's complex. People like people don't, people don't like people. People have a bias, they don't have a bias, but how do you translate all that into yourself and become a better person for it? So 100%. Yeah, 100%. And now that, like I was saying before, there's, there's, there's recourse to everything that you do. And it, like you said to <laughs> people where you're like what you're there and you're not. Um, but the, the biggest thing is, is to show up, you know, and you're going to make bad choices. Sometimes you're going to make good choices other times. But we have to keep going um, and every day is a new day and you have this opportunity each new day to start anew, you know, and to cleanse your energy of the past because the past is the past. You, you can't change anything in the past um, and the future is still to be written uh, as we say in our, our closing point. Um, they actually say that depression is a, an overall um, kind of looping of memory. Mm -hmm. of the past, whereas anxiety is this uh, mental looping of fear of the future. Uh, and both of them, as I say, past and future, take you out of that present day. Um, and that's a difficult thing because if you're, if you're constantly worrying about the past, if any actions from the past or inaction, or you're worrying about the future, then you're never 
fully present. And you know, what a shame, what, what a complete shame. And I, I, I've been through both depression and anxiety, and it is a huge shame. Um, but the biggest thing is, is that you can wake up every brand new day and start a new, every moment you can start a new and just transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the different philosophers that we're going to bring in and the different experiences from our lives. Um, and again, by no means are we saying that we're any bit of an expert on any of this, but we're here to contribute. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing that humans can do is we can all contribute to one another. Uh, and I think from that ability to contribute, the expertise arises um, and it arises in your own listening skills um, that then push off into your own world and experience as well. Um, mm-hmm. And that goes for a multifold. Right. And I think that to that point, um, you know, it would be nice as we unfold and unpack these, these podcasts. Um, one of the things that Heidegger talks about is asking the question, mm-hmm. uh, but not just asking the question, but to listen to the answer and not necessarily listening to rebut it and come up with, you know, your, your, how you're going to, you know, form your own opinion and, and debate it, but just to listen, ask more questions. And that's one thing that with social media that we don't do is we judge people on 140 characters. We see a post mm-hmm. and we define mm-hmm. that person as that post and we'll call them names. And, and yeah. what I think what hopefully these podcasts, so if, if, if there's even a listener who's passionate about wanting into getting into a conversation about something, we're always open to dialoguing with people um, to expand our minds and everybody else's minds through a conversation that's a civil back and forth, not accusatory. Yeah. Right. Like, let's just unpack it. Let's talk about yep. it. Let's um, delve into it because everybody has a voice. Everybody has a perspective. They have their uniqueness that makes mm-hmm. them an individual. But how does that contribute to the community? Um, that exactly. we all are as human beings. So um, it will be nice, like I said, as, as these podcasts unfold to, to bring people in to, to, to have those conversations, but with an idea of we all should walk away changed. And how do you walk away to your point um, being different the next day? Um, right. How do you make those changes? And that first one comes up with self-awareness that, okay, so I've got this thing that I've got to change, or I didn't like this that happened yesterday. How do I change it today? Because I am somebody like you. I don't, I've never had really depression. Um, I've never had anxiety. Um, I don't, <laughs> I know I, I have people who have it. I just had a conversation yeah. this morning with a friend of mine who's on antidepressants, who's depressed. Mm-hmm. And I just go in there, let's clean your house. Let's do this. Let's fix this. Let's fix that. Um, and, I, and I'm actually, I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have ulcers. Um, I'm not on any kind of medication whatsoever. Um, so I've, I've found something that works for me. Um, and everybody has to find what works for them. Mm-hmm. And to your point about living in the moment, I don't think about the past. I don't think about my age. I don't think about, I, I reflect on childhood of bad things that happen and good things that happen, but I don't let it define my my moment, my present. Um, I'm also not thinking about the, the the future, and this is what I would envision and hope for everybody. I've had these conversations with Todd, my one of my employees. Out, he's got a master's in philosophy, so you'll hear me talk about him a lot because we get into conversations. I said, but um, ultimately, I trust myself. I have spent a lifetime of learning and and being open to new learning. That I, if nothing else, I've learned to trust that no matter what situation you give me, I will figure out a way to solve it and solve it for me in the moment. And then if I don't solve it, I'll fix it again the next time. So that's what hopefully we unpack in future podcasts is, is how do we learn as human beings to, to trust our judgment and, and bring people around us that um, if we're lacking in an area like a, a Sir Richard Branson, he said that I hire really smart people around me who are smarter than me. Mm-hmm. So again, how do we bring friends around us that are smarter than us in a way or in tune with us that help us along our journey as well? Right. And, you know, that's so wonderful. I always learn from you too about being, you know, stopping my anxiety or depression. So I thank you for your friendship um, and your Aww. perspective. Well, you, too. <laughs> you add value immensely to my life in different ways. So thank you. Um, thank you. But yeah, that's, I, I think that life is difficult. It is it is hard. And how do you bring people around you that um, are going to help you through? Because again, I had my own little store. I had my own troubles through that store that were just overwhelming. I just lost my mother in February. um, And I wasn't taking it very well at first. And so it's my friends around me that help either distract me or motivate me or inspire me um, that help me um, 
help me cope with my 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 issues my own way. Um, yeah. But again, it's how like me learning how to learn through podcasts um, and listening to documentaries. Um, that's you have to find what works for you, and that's a yeah, lifetime absolutely. journey. Absolutely, and you know, to for those that are suffering from any anxiety or, and anxiety or depression, um, if you don't have a good support group around you that that's okay too one of the best things that you can do um and i actually had it this morning because i was on a little bit of a mental spin <laughs> but think about five things that you're grateful for um and that could even be as simple but as big like it's just a simple thing as clean water but it's also a very big thing if you think about other parts of the world that don't have it so look at around your surroundings and just really going into that state of gratitude because the brain can't to, the brain can't have two um, opposing thoughts going on at the same time. So you, you can't go into your negative thinking when you're ups, when you're trying to do positive thinking. And the best way to get into positive thinking is through gratitude, which is still, it's, it's almost this full encompassment of your past, present, and future, right? So it, you have these things around you or these experiences around you because of your past. And there's going to be good stuff in you know, your past as well. And you're present and you're being aware of them and thankful for them in the present. Um, and it's giving you that support and strength for the future. So I would highly suggest to our listeners, if you are going through any hard times, um, make yourself get into this state of gratitude. Even if you're just thinking of one thing that you're grateful for in that moment, that one thing will get you out of that loop spin. That And and again, it goes to your, your eating as well. Like we can't help but stress the the I especially me um the importance of eating wisely because if um, we'll talk about this later on too but your serotonin most of it's made in your gut um, and your serotonin is a neurotransmitter that helps you relax um if you don't have a healthy gut um as amy said you're doing well and you can coast one day and then the, <laughs> the next day you're like blah um so for sure it does work yeah. but we want to be here with you um as you go through it and want to collaborate with you. And um, so we're looking forward to any, any comments that you have, um, any pieces of your personal wisdom. Um, you can contact us on social media, um, anything, you know, critique is fine too. That's how we learn. And again, what Amy was saying, how we get into a mindful conversation with the, with the other, because we're, we're all the other to ourselves. Um, you know, that's how, that's how we grow as mm -hmm. a total, a total um, human yep. race and being and species. Yep, and um, topic ideas. If you have topic ideas that you think yes. that you want us to discuss um, and, you know, bring in some of the artists or philosophers that we're working on to, 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 to hear what, from their perspective. So, um, again, you know, our YouTube, you know, in the comment section, just ask, you know, what questions are. And we're happy to, to drive off of, you know, your interest as well. So these podcasts aren't just about our philosophy. It's about what's of interest to our listeners as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll incorporate those in and, and, and have some really great conversations. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing everything, Elena. appreciate your you. going into um, all of you know, how you've, you've started your path. And I'm excited for the next conversations. Likewise, likewise. Thank you for everything you're contributing. Um, and thank you for the listeners as well. Yep. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody. Have a good one. Well, that's the end of this podcast. And we want to thank you for joining us because we know there are a lot of things that you can be doing right now. And we are grateful to spend the time with you. We hope that you're thinking more about how you can make small changes this week that can help you move your life forward in the direction that you are seeking. If you like this podcast, please share it on your social media platforms and tell those around you so that we can help expand their minds. You can also support us on Patreon where, for based on your donation level, we offer one-on-one -on -one time with either Elena, myself, Amy, and or the two of us together as being paleo, offering guidance and advice. We also have merchandise by level of sponsorship, patron call-outs, and much more. Sometimes it's not knowing where you want to go in your future, but knowing where you don't want to be in your life today. What may seem like a problem today may actually be the catalyst needed for change towards your future. However hard, be kind to yourself and be open to those moments calling for change. Your story is still being written and you are a beautiful being.